Mark, yesterday in Mathematica, I did a typo and I put a minus instead of a plus in the energy of the harmonic oscillator. The harmonic oscillator is n plus one half, as we derived, and in the notebook, somehow I put a minus. I did have a flinch when I was typing it and seeing the plot. As you saw, the, the curve was almost perfect. It was not as perfect as I recalled. And indeed, if you put a plus, it becomes really spot on going through the middle of the bullets. Of course, since m was big, it doesn't make much of a difference if you put plus or minus, but of course you should put the correct sign, and it was just a typo. So if you, I don't know if the notebook is already on the website, but if it is, and if you played with it, you probably can now change the sign to the correct sign and see that it becomes even more cool. Okay, very good. Any question about yesterday before we move to the next topic, which is spin chains? No? It was clear? Very good. So on to spin chains, which will occupy us now. Spin chains and the interface between spin chains and field theory will, uh, will be the main subject of our lectures for a few days now. So let's start with the simplest and <coughs> probably most famous of all spin chains, which is the Heisenberg spin chain, whose Hamiltonian is just some interaction between neighbors. Let's say we have a spin chain of length L, and we just have a spin interaction of the spin at position n, scalar product with a spin at position n plus 1. Okay? Just some spin-spin interaction between positions n and positions n plus 1. So what we have in mind is some, let's say, periodic boundary conditions, and we have a spin chain where at each side of the spin chain I have my my uh, two-dimensional Hilbert space, the spin can be up or down, and there are L of these sides, and we want to consider this Hamiltonian, which is called the Heisenberg XXX, X, 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 because it's isotropic, so the direction X, direction Y, and direction Z are all the same. There is SU2 symmetry, that's why it's called XXX. X, X. You can consider xxz, which would be, for example, sigma x, sigma x, plus sigma y, sigma y, plus a constant times sigma z, sigma z. It would be some anisotropy. For example, for some materials, they might not have total spherical symmetry, but might be slightly anisotropic along some direction. Or it could be xxy, xyz, which would be sigma x, sigma x, another constant for sigma y, sigma y, and another constant for sigma z, sigma z. Okay? But for now, we consider the most isotropic of all. So this is the Heisenberg XXX uh, spin chain. Okay? Very good. Where the sigma are Pauli matrices. Acting on sites, in this case, n plus 1 the arrow, the one that, oh, that I'm pointing at. Okay? Any question here? So now let me, let me just write a simple statement, and then I can go into any level of detail as you want. So let me put some dot, 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 and then we fill the dot, dot, dot. But I just want to say that this Hamiltonian has another way of writing it, which is just sum over all sides, and then I do nothing, or I swap, I permute, this is the permutation operator. That acts on two spins, flipping them. Acting on sites j and j plus uh, n and n plus 1. <clears throat> okay? So this spin system is equivalent either to having a spin interaction plus some constant, eventually. The zero energy, I'm not keeping track of. Okay? So let me first ask if this looks totally mysterious or plausible. So is this plausible that something like this should be? Is it obvious that something like this should, uh, should be true? And the answer should be yes, for the following reason. So let me explain why this has to work, and then I can go into any level of detail filling in the dot, 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 as you might want. Okay? But let me first tell you why this had to work. This is an Hamiltonian with SU2 symmetry of nearest neighbors, right? So it has SU2 symmetry. I can rotate 
my spins, and because it's a scalar project, it's invariant. So this is invariant on the SU2 symmetry. This guy commutes with all generators of SU2. Okay, if I rotate, the Hamiltonian doesn't care. This is why it's XXX. Good? First thing. Now, if you have something that is invariant under SU2, it means that if you have some state in some representation of SU2 and act uh, with the Hamiltonian, uh, it gives, uh, it is diagonalized if it is in a fixed representation. Right? So states in the same representation, because the generators commute with the Hamiltonian, give the same thing. So this interaction, I can write it as a sum of two projectors. Projector into singlet representation of two spins that form a singlet, or projector into the triplet. But projector into the triplet and into the singlet are themselves linear combinations of identity and permutation, and therefore this had to work. Okay? Anyway, I see that not everyone seems to be convinced, so let's, let me work out the details. I think it, it might be better. Even though this is one of the exercises for today, but let's, let's fill in this dot, dot, dot. Okay. So let, let me ju let's just write something simple that sigma dot sigma n n plus 1 is just the total spin I can write the square of the total spin minus sigma n plus 1 square minus sigma n minus n square Okay, here I just completed the squares. Okay? Furthermore, the Pauli matrices are not really the generators of SU2. The generators of SU2 are Pauli matrices over 2, right? Sigma Z over 2 is what gives 1 half and minus 1 half, right? So well, let's just normalize them more properly. Let's put here, sorry for the mess, let's put here over 2, let's put here over 2, let's put here over 2, and then I have to put a 4 here. Now, this is the total spin at position n. This, we know what this is. This is just j, j plus 1, with spin 1 half. Right? That's no doubt. It is just, uh, or you can compute explicitly, the, scale, the square of sigma z plus the square of sigma x plus square of sigma y, and you will see that you get this. Is it clear? What about this one here? This is the total spin. I mean, all this you saw in addition of quantum uh, angular momentum in quantum mechanics, I'm assuming, but okay, I'm just reminding you. As you add this, this gives again j, j plus 1, of course, it's a total angular momentum, but now it depends with j equals 0 for the singlet, if the two spins combine to make a spin 0 state, that is up, down, minus, down, up, and j equal 1, for the triplet. Singlet that this is anti-symmetric. And triplet that is symmetric. Right? The triplet is up, 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 down, plus, down, up, or down, down. In other words, okay? <clears throat> In other words, this quantity here is equal to 2 times j equals 0, so 0 times the projector into anti-symmetric. Doesn't matter what this projector is, because it's multiplied by 0. Plus 2 times the projector into symmetric representations. When j is equal to 1, 1 times 1 plus 1 is 2. Minus the constant contributions from the other two terms. There are two such terms, and when j is equal to 1 half, 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves. So 2 times 3 quarters. And what are these projectors? Of course, they are just projector into anti-symmetric is identity minus permutation over 2, and projector into symmetric is identity plus permutation over 2. Right? So if you act on something symmetric, multiplying by identity plus permutation does nothing. If you act on something anti-symmetric, multiplying by identity minus Permutation gives nothing again, and you can easily check that they are well-normalized projectors. If you multiply two of them, you get back the same thing. Is it clear? And now, as you see, 
This is just a linear combination. So this is times the identity, of course. So this, there is just identity and permutation. That's the only thing that could appear. So this statement is correct. And if you work out the normalization with this minus lambda here, I think there is a minus p here. OK, the minus comes because there is a minus explicitly. The only p comes from here. There is p over 2 times 2 times 2. That looks like it's 2. Perhaps I forgot an overall 2, but I don't think so. So what did I do wrong? j, j plus 1, 2. When j is equal to 1, yeah, perhaps there is a 2. OK. OK. Anyway, this is just some simple algebra. It's not the main purpose. <clears throat> but this is an, a spin chain with uh, nearest neighbor interaction and SU2 symmetry. And it's the only spin chain with nearest neighbor interaction and SU2 spin. Because of what I said, because if you have any spin chain with SU2 symmetry, having a spin chain of nearest neighbors with SU2 symmetry, by definition, is the same as saying that that spin chain is alpha times p minus plus beta times p plus, where alpha and beta are two constants. That's the only thing it can be. It must be projector into the, the representations of SU2. There are only two. And of course, the identity is irrelevant, so all that matters is that there is a permutation. Identity is just a constant shift of my energy levels of my Hamiltonian. So all Hamiltonians with SU2 symmetry and nearest neighbors are basically given by the permutation operator that swaps two spins at position n, n plus 1. OK? This normalization, putting here a 1, of course, I can ignore it or not. It is just, I like to put it like this, because then the state with all spins up is normalized to have zero energy. It's the only reason why I like it. OK? OK? So this, as we said, is the only nearest neighbor uh, Hamiltonian. OK. Um, so what happens with the, uh, so what's the physics of this Hamiltonian? Well, this Hamiltonian normalized as it is with this lambda, assuming this lambda is positive, is ferromagnetic. It wants to align all the spins, because you see that we want the spin, we prefer the spin to be, um, to be 1, then we have more negative values, there is a minus sign, so we want the spin to be 1. We prefer the interactions to privilege 3 plots all over, so we are in the ferromagnetic state, that's the highest energy state. So the ground state is the ferromagnetic, so the ground state This is for lambda positive. It's just everyone is spin up. Okay. This is our vacuum. And then excitations are described by having almost everyone up, except a few spins that are down. And these spins down, they don't stay still because of the permutation operator that starts moving them. So these spins down then will move. This excitation, this is an excitation and it will be moving in the spin chain. And this is another excitation and it will be moving in the spin chain. Okay? Because there is this hopping, this is what we people in condensed matter call this hopping term. So these spins move, and they might interact with each other. So these spins, we think of them as excitations. They are like our particles. These spins, these excitations, are what people call magnons. So magnetic excitations, these spin down that move in our spin chain, these are these magnons. OK? Sorry? Ah, no, this is just a schematic. I just imagine I prepare two excitations and I will bash them against each other. OK, any question here? Am I going too slowly? Have you seen most of this in condensed matter or something? It's a bit slow. OK, let's speed up. So 
So let's let's make a, a claim that is, looks innocuous, but it's quite deep, which is that the following claim. The following claim is that let, let me write a wave function for three magnets, and it will become clear why I'm considering three excitations instead of starting with one and two. And let me claim that the following wave function diagonalizes. So the claim is, I'm going to write something, and the claim is that this wave function diagonalizes the, the, the Eisenberg Hamilton. Okay? So what is this wave function? So that's the claim. The wave function is the following. I can write it as, well, I just specify where are the magnets. So there will be some wave function. And then spin up until there is a spin down at position n1. And then a spin down at position n2. And then a spin down at position n3. OK? So that, and I sum over n1 smaller than n2, smaller than n3, up to L. OK? So this is obvious, any states of this form, where this wave function, psi, of n1, n2, n3, is equal, and I will write it as a picture because I will soon explain what each term means, so a picture is good, as good as a formula, is equal to a sum of three factorial terms. Is equal to this, plus this, plus this, plus this, plus this, plus this. Okay? Where by let me tell you what a given one picture, one of these pictures means, then you can easily understand all of them. For example, let me say what this one, how do I decode this picture into a formula? I think that I have my excitations with some momentum, P1, P2, and P3, my three magnets, and they scatter, they interacted with each other as represented by the space-time diagram. So that, I say that particle, with momentum P2 scattered with, moment, with particle with momentum P3. You see, there is this first scattering here when P2 scattered with P3, followed by P1 scattering with P3, S of P1 scattering with P3. And after they scatter, the P's are reordered. Now P3 is at the first position, P1 is at the second position, and P2 is at the last position. So we write a plane wave, e to the i, p3 n1 plus i, p2, p1 n2, plus i, p2 n1. Okay, you see a plane wave where the momenta are reordered, and they have some, some S matrix here, whereas the first term, for example, would be just e to the i, p1 n1, plus i, p2 n2, plus i, p3, n3. And where this, this function here, s, which is called the s matrix, s of p and q is equal to u of p minus u of q minus i over u of p minus u of q plus i, where u of p is just a convenient function, which is one half of cotangent of p over 2. Okay? So let's digest a little bit the physics of this formula. Let me raise this blackboard. So what is going on here? Here we are saying that if you have three excitations, you can think of them in the following way. You can think that there is an incoming wave. So this is like incoming. And then these, these magnets are moving, and they can scatter with each other, interact. So this term, for example, is one of the outcomes of a scattering process. And then this S here is really the S matrix, is the phase acquired by two particles when they scatter one by each other. 
So that's the definition of an S matrix. What's the S matrix? You look at a given incoming wave, you look at an outgoing wave, you compare the coefficients, and this is what an S matrix is by definition. Right? It tells you the relative amplitude for incoming versus out outgoing states. Sorry. OK? So before we move into the physics, I just want to make sure that the mathematical claim is, uh, is well understood. Is it clear what the claim is? Is that this wave function diagonalizes the Hamiltonian. OK? So uh, you can now write down any of the six terms, am I right? But you just saw how uh, I did for one of them. You can do for the other ones. So the wave function is totally explicit. It's the sum of three terms. What, are, what other comments we can make? We can make that, obviously, my claim is not restricted to three magnets. Now that you saw for three magnets, you can also put any number of magnets. OK, so let's make a few comments. Now. OK, so the generalization for n magnets uh, is, uh, is obvious, um, right? So for two magnets, we would write just, right? For four magnets, we would write a sum of four factorial terms. Right, which will contain, say, this plus all possible permutations of four elements, which are four factorial of them, and so on and so forth. In general, we'll have n factorial terms. And if my claim is correct, it's very clear how to write a general state for any number of excitations. OK? Is it clear? Okay. But this is uh, a generalization. Yeah. Okay. But the, the real question is, why does this work? The real question is, why does it work? And we should have in mind that here we are saying something quite impressive. We are saying that we scatter three particles, and we get three particles back, where all that can happen is that the momentum of the excitations can be permuted. Now, why is this true? A priori, it did not need to be. If I scatter excitations, Energy and momentum needs to be conserved. But there is no reason for the individual momenta to be preserved and to just be swapped. Right? In fact, sometimes it does. In two dimensions, you know this experiment where you have these, these strings with a ball and you draw the ball and you're tuck, tuck, tuck. So in two dimensions, when you have a collision of two particles, conserving energy and momenta does imply that the momenta can at most be permuted. That's why balls do like this. They just stop and the other one moves. But for three particles, no. If you just tell me that the sum of energies of three particles and the sum of momenta of three particles is conserved, the final set of momenta and the original set of momenta did not need to be the same. OK? okay. So the question is, why did it work? And the answer is because there is some hidden symmetry which is integrability. OK? So basically, what we are seeing is that we prepare three particles and we scatter them. That's what the first term is. So we have p1, p2, and p3. And we got three particles at the end, p1 prime, p2 prime, p3 prime. OK? And what we saw is that these particles are equal to the original set eventually permuted. But other than permutation, uh, but up to permutations, it is, the, it is just the same set. So this is very unreasonable, as we said. Why would this be the case? 
right? If you are an experimentalist and you scatter three particles and you receive the same three particles at, at the end, you become very surprised, right? Because you say that as they scatter, energy and momentum needed to be conserved. But why are the individual particle momenta conserved? You will be very surprised as an experiment. And then you try to come up with a picture of the world. What could be going on? And there's only one reasonable explanation. So the reasonable, the only reasonable explanation is that when the particles were scattering in this blob, it should be effectively as if inside my experiment they are only scattering in a pairwise way. They are only scattering in a sequence of two body particle scattering events. Okay? Because if that were the case, then I could explain why what, uh, what I got is true. Because at each of these events, the momenta can at most be permuted. That's a property in two dimensions, as we said. In two dimensions, whenever I scatter two particles, I get the same momenta or they permute. So if my three body scattering event was in as if they scattered in a chronological order well separated, then I would have an explanation for my outcome of my experiment. Okay? So either this or I believe in winning the lottery. I mean, this is, right? Now, now the reason is then why would this factorize? What would be the reason? And you can think a little bit that this set would be, the final set would be equal to the original set if there existed some hidden charges like, let's suppose we have some Q, some charge Q3. I call it 3 because Q1 and Q2 are reserved for momentum and energy. Let's suppose we have some charge Q3 in some quantum mechanics example, which would be the sum of the cube of the momentum and not the square or the linear term. Okay, momentum would be sum of p, energy would be sum of p squared, and now I say my theory also has sum of p cube is also conserved. It's another charge. Well, now if I impose that sum of p, sum of p squared, and sum of p cube is conserved, then indeed I do guarantee that p1, p2, p3 is equal to p1 prime, p2 prime, p3 prime. Then it would be enough. Okay? So it must somehow be that the existence of higher charges implies which implies this, it should imply very directly this picture here. Right? Because mathematically we are seeing that everything is consistent. Is it clear? And how does it work? Does it work? Yes, indeed. There is a very nice exercise you can do, which is to show that this, you can ask how does this act on a wave packet? You prepare a wave packet and you act with this charge P cube on a wave packet. And this shifts wave packets by a p-dependent, a momentum-dependent amount. Which means that if a theory has such symmetry, and I prepare some wave packets that are going to scatter at the same position, by acting with this symmetry, I am shifting the wave packets, but I shift the wave packets by different amounts. So even if they were designed to scatter at the same position, they will no longer scatter at the same position. Because each wave packet was shifted by a different amount. So now they scatter one after the other. And I could, of course, act with an opposite sign of the generator, and then I would get cartoons like this, which tell me that in theories where I have hidden symmetries, two things happen. One is that the scattering of, three, of many particles can be decomposed into the scattering of two particles. And the second thing is that the order doesn't matter, and I can reorder and scatter them in any possible way. Okay? And indeed, this is perfectly compatible with what we are seeing. We are seeing that here, indeed, I'm saying that I have some incoming particles and some outgoing particles, and the incoming and the outgoing just differ by sequences of two body S matrices, S of P2, P3 times S of P1, P3, and so on and so forth that all that matters is, in practice, swapping two particles at a time. OK? Again, this does not assume any kind of dilute approximation where particles are very separated or anything like that. Nothing of what I said assumes that. 
It does assume, however, the existence of some hidden local charges like Q3. Okay? So then the natural question is that we are going to put a bit on hold for a few minutes because I want to explore further this statement is where are these hidden charges that explain that explain the remarkable simplicity and the fact that we could just write down the solution to this problem. Which a priori you should have in mind that if I tell you diagonalize a spin chain Hamiltonian, you cannot do it. It's a 2 to the L by 2 to the L matrix and you put it in a computer up to length 10 and that's it. And here it's much more powerful, I'm telling you. Here is a solution, plus I'm giving you the solution right away. And of course it's something very deep and very powerful. And the reason is because these charges, these hidden charges must be somehow hidden in our spin chain Hamiltonian. So we should find them so that we can explain this uh, powerful claim. Yes? Um, have you proved the claim? Or? No. In this, in this way? By this argument, you mean? Because if the claim is true, then it implies integrability. No, no, no. It's the other way around. It's the existence of vector and extra charges that implies that the scattering is effectively factorized. And therefore, that when you scatter particles, all that happens is that the momenta can at both be swapped. So the fact that these extra charges exist tell you that there should be an ansatz where you start with an incoming wave and then just write a bunch of other waves which just differ from the first one by swapping the momentum. And this tells you this kind of ansatz with n factorial terms should be a good ansatz. And this was the insight of beta. Beta, Hans beta, he developed the beta ansatz, which is exactly a guess for the wave function which tells you that if I have this integrability, if particles scatter in this way that at most the momenta is swapped, I should write an ansatz with n factorial terms, all possible permutations of the momenta. And even more than that, I, should, I know what the coefficient of each plane wave is because I know that each configuration differs from the other one by a particular sequence of scattering events. So I immediately write down that they just differ by a product of S matrices. But then, of course, I need to find this S matrix. And this I find by plugging this wave function into the Hamiltonian and seeing what S matrix do I need to diagonalize it. How did you get the exponential factor? How do you match the momentum uh, with the site locations there? I'm a bit confused why. Yeah. No, I, I, this is just uh, the statement that if you have, uh, I'm not sure I understand your, your, your confusion. So, the wave function is parameterized by three momenta, p1, p2, p3, which are the momenta of the magnets. And, uh, and this is the wave function. What is the confusion? Ah, two n1s, that must be a typo. N1 and two n3. Ah, that's a typo, yeah, that's a typo. So let's see, p3 goes to position n1, p1 goes to position n2, and p2 goes to position n3. Okay, sorry. Yeah, one such system is this one. The simplest ferromagnetic spin chain you could write has this property. Um, I mean, I would expect that if I write this, then if I want to scatter the magnons, then I would generally not just swap the momentas, but write all possible combinations, right? I mean, it's not necessary that they're just going to swap the momentum. For a general spin chain, no. That's true. For example, I'm... Imagine I consider a, a spin chain, not of spin one half, but spin one. And instead of sigma dot sigma, I write s dot s, where s are spin one generators. And now I put three excitations on this spin chain and start moving them and scatter them. They don't preserve, they, they are just, it's not an integrable spin chain, for example, that one. With spins one half, there's only one possible spin chain, and luckily it turns out to be integrable. So then the question is, where are these charges? How do we know if it's integrable or not? Which ones are the special spin chains and which ones are the ones that we are doomed to put in a computer, right? So then it, there is this question that you are asking. If I put there, instead of sigma dot sigma, s dot s for general spin s, I scatter three, three particles with the momentum p1, p2, p3. I get p1 prime, p2 prime, p3 prime. But these momenta did not, are not related in a trivial way to the first ones. 
They obey energy and momentum conservation, but otherwise there is a continuous phase space and it's a mess. But there are some special theories for which there is hidden symmetries and therefore particles scatter as if they scattered in a factorized way. So these, if you want, are the next two simplest theories after free theories. So we have free theories, and then we have integrable theories, which are theories where they can be strongly coupled. This S matrix can be complicated. Indeed, this S matrix is not particularly simple. You see, it's a bunch of cotangents, that's one. It, 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 it is a strongly coupled theory. However, the scattering factorizes into sequence of two-body scattering events. So it's a big simplicity, because if you want to scatter 20 particles against each other, all you need to know is how two particles scatter. It's a big simplicity. In general, in a theory, if you want to study how 20 particles scatter, you have to start from scratch and recompute everything from the beginning. And here it's a big simplicity which characterizes integrable theories, which is that the scattering can be decomposed into smaller building blocks, which is the two-body S matrix. So this is a very important question. Where are these hidden charges and so on? So let's postpone this question for a bit and continue exploring. Um, let's explore a bit more the claim. OK, well, let's first explore this claim a little bit more before going and addressing this important question of where are these charges? Why did this work? OK? And the first thing I want to point out, we want to, uh, to ask is, OK, it diagonalizes the Hamiltonian with what eigenvalue? OK, so we are claiming that H psi equal energy times psi. And then you ask, OK, so what is the spectrum? Yeah. So let's first understand this question. Okay. So we write this wave function, and we act with the Hamiltonian. <coughs> okay. And this equation, right? Um, one thing I can do is look at the terms with n1 very separated from n2, very separated from n3. By very separated, it's enough that there is at least one spin in between, but okay, well, let's assume they are very, all well, very well separated. <clears throat> and then we compare those terms on the left and on the right. So we look at a given term, and on the right hand side, we have energy times that given cat, where I have some position down here, some position down here, and some position down here. Okay? I get energy times this cat times the wave function times one exponential. Okay? Let's look at one of them. Let's look at the first exponential P1N1 plus P2N2 plus P3N3. Okay? And then there are other exponentials, but I don't care. What about the right hand side? What about the right hand side? We want to compare. Which terms on the right hand side contribute will give this cat? Okay? Now there are on the on, on the left hand side, sorry. On the left hand side, we have the following. If we act with Identity minus permutation, any place here on this first part of the spin chain, I get zero. Because identity does nothing and permutation permutes up, up, which does nothing as well. So identity minus permutation here does nothing. And the only places that matter is when the Hamiltonian acts here, or here, or here, or here, or here, or here. So there are only these terms that matter, right? All other terms, they just give zero and they don't contribute to this particular cat. Now, if the spin were already, sorry, what did I, it's not here, I wanted to draw here. If the spin is already down, is already at the right position, then the terms that give back the cat are the identity from the Hamiltonian, okay? So there, are the, there is the identity here that gives twice the same wave function. So there is, there is an overall lambda, 
and then there will be twice the same wave function. Or the permutation, or if the spin is before, or if the spin is after, and then the wave function differs by minus e to the i p1 minus e to the minus i p1. This is for the first excitation, plus the same thing for p2, plus the same thing for p3, times the same wave function, times the same cat, times the same wave function. This is just the same as in the previous line. So this is the eigenvalue. So we conclude that the energy is just the sum of the energy of particle pj, where j runs from 1 to 3, where this epsilon is just lambda times 2 minus 2 cosine of p, which is lambda times 4 sine square of p over 2, which is lambda over u square plus 1 quarter, if you use the relation between u and p that I wrote there. I leave it as an exercise to check. Okay? So this was a bit fast, but the only reason why I did it a bit fast is because the result is kind of obvious. What we are saying is that the energy is just the energy of each of the excitations. So what I could do, of course that's obvious because the particles are well separated. I measure the energy, and the energy is just the energy of each excitation. Right? Like in quantum mechanics, when I write a bunch of particles, the energy is p squared plus p squared plus p squared. I just use the, distance, the region where they are well separated to measure it. So that's clear. And the energy of one excitation is clear. I just put a single plane wave, and when I act with the Hamiltonian, I either shift to the left or shift to the right, and I get e to the ip, e to the minus ip, and therefore the eigenvalue is just the dispersion relation is just the usual type of dispersion relation for spin chains with a cosine of p. Okay? Yes? Can you explain the psi that you said that actualizes h? Do you mean that each term in that sum is an eigenstate? No. Okay. No. However, to measure the energy, each of them is. Because what's happening is that to measure the energy, the solution is this one here. Indeed, we go to the asymptotic region and we measure the energy of each excitation. Then what happens is that as these excitations are moving, they scatter, and there is a scattering region that tells us what's the relative coefficient between each term that I can measure in the asymptotic region. Exactly like in quantum mechanics, when I have P1, P2 coming in, and then P1, P2 getting out. And if I want to measure the energy, I can go to infinity, and both terms diagonalize the Hamiltonian. But they are not independent. They must be glued in a particular way, and that I fix by going to the core, to the interaction part of the, of the potential. What do you mean by okay. eigenstate diagonalizing the Hamiltonian? It's an eigenstate, or? So then when that, this, this statement is true. Diagonalize the Hamiltonian means I act with the Hamiltonian on psi and I get energy times psi. Okay? Now, if I take just the first plane wave, just an incoming plane wave, it seems like it works from what I just explained here. But this is because I took them to be well separated. If I now consider the contribution when the spins are very close to each other, I see that it would fail. It will not work. And then I would see that I need another outgoing plane wave. Which is the same in quantum mechanics. I have some scattering through a potential. I try to solve it with just an incoming plane wave, and I see that I need an outgoing plane wave to solve the system as well. But if I focus on very far away, of course, I have no potential, and I can put just an incoming plane wave. This here? Yeah. Okay, well, then I, I will do it a bit slower. I did not want to go to this one. So let's consider one excitation. Then my wave function is sum e to the i p n times excitation at position n. And then if I act with the Hamiltonian on my psi, I get what? I get a sum over n. And now when I act with identity, I do nothing. When I act with identity and permutation, all I need to do is study what happens close to n. And I see that I get, so 
might mean write explicit. The only terms that matter are when the identity acts here. So I get twice e to the i p n times lambda times the same state. Or when the permutation acts here, or when the permutation acts here, those also don't give zero, so minus and now this excitation is at position n plus one minus and now this excitation is at position n minus one. which is equal. Now I just collect terms and reorder the summation length. So this is equal to 2 lambda minus, sorry, there's no 2. It's just one single permutation in the second terms, minus lambda e to the i p minus lambda e to the minus i p times the sum over n e to the i p n times spin flip at position n, which is back my state psi, and this is my energy of my excitation p. Okay? So in going from here to here, I just have to, to, to add plus 1, subtract minus 1, so if I want to keep track of the terms, this is minus And now, once you understand one particle, you see that more particles doesn't matter because they are well separated, so they don't talk to each other. So the same thing happens for P1, for P2, and for P3. And for the other wave functions that are reshuffled, I would not get epsilon of P1 plus epsilon of P2 plus epsilon of P3, but I would get epsilon of P3 plus epsilon of P1 plus epsilon of P2, which is the same thing. So at the end, each plane wave gives the same eigenvalue. Uh, n2 minus 1 or something like that? Very good. So then the question is, does it work when they are very close? Because when they are very close is when the wave functions are starting to interact. And that's where um, uh, you could imagine that things could just fail. And indeed, when they are very close, as I said, a single plane wave does not diagonalize the Hamiltonian. Right? That's why, for example, if you have two particles, you need to consider the incoming wave plus the outgoing wave. It's the combination of the two that diagonalize this Hamiltonian. And if you plug it and act with the Hamiltonian, the terms when they are well separated, it's trivial. It works and it just gives the energy epsilon of P1 plus epsilon of P2. If you want to match the terms where they are close, it will tell you what the S matrix is. Do you agree? I mean, without any loss of generality, say for two particles, you can write that the result must be A times incoming plane wave plus B times outgoing plane wave. Because energy and momentum is conserved, so that's the only thing you could write. So then the question is fixing A over B. Of course, overall normalization doesn't matter, so. And that you fix by solving Schrodinger equation. And that tells you what the S matrix is. Okay? In today's tutorial, one of the exercises is exactly this. It's just saying, take the two particle wave function as is, with incoming wave plus S matrix times outgoing wave, and act with it on the, with the Hamiltonian and see that it diagonalizes and that it fixes the S matrix. So here I did for one particle. There is also an exercise, check that one particle is an eigenvalue. I just did it here. And then the second exercise, you check that two particles is also an, eigen, an eigenvector of the Hamiltonian. Is it clear? I tried to do it a little bit faster than usual. I guess it was maybe a bit too fast. So, So that's the first thing, the spectrum. I just have a bunch, the, the description starts to be very clear. I have a bunch of excitations called magnets. They move around, they scatter with each other, and then the energy of my excited spin chain states are the energy of the sum of the, sum of the energies of the magnets. Okay, that's very clear. Is it clear? The physics? Now, the next question is, well, but what are these momenta, P1, P2, P3? Are they whatever I want? 
Then I put P1, P2, P3 to be whatever I want. Sorry? Is there constraint to be conserved? Uh, there is no constraint to be conserved because uh, what constraint do you speak about? So imagine I have P1, P2, P3. If I'm telling you that in the end I have P1, P2, P3 at most permuted, they are conserved by definition. Right. So there is no constraint from conservation of momentum. It's built in in the fact that they are only swapped at most in any interaction. So that, that no. I mean, any, or everything I wrote is compatible with momentum and energy conservation, and even more than that, to integrability conservation, if you want. Very good. Of course, the system is of, at finite volume, is a finite system, so we, the spectrum cannot be continuous, and it's quantized because it is at finite volume. So the next thing we have to do is, what's your name? Sorry, I forgot. As Michael said, we impose periodic boundary conditions. So we still need... to impose periodic boundary conditions that will quantize the moment of my excitations, which read that the wave function <clears throat> n1, n2, n3 should be equal to the wave function if I take n1 and shift it by l. And I, 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 when I shift n1 by l, I put it at the end because by definition, my ends are ordered in the way I write my wave function. Okay? So this is the condition of periodicity. So this must be true for any n1, n2, and n3. Now, if I look at my wave function and check whether this is true for any n1, n2, n3. What I will do is, when I plug this in, I collect the same exponential on the left and right hand side, and exponential by exponential, it must be true, because it's true for any n. Right? So let's look, for example, at, let's look here, at what I get from the term, from this term. From this term in the wave function, I get e to the i, p1, and then for p1 I plug the value n2, plus i, p2, n3, plus i, p3, n1, plus l. Okay? And then, uh, here, I want to look at an, exp at an exponential that will have this exponential. But what exponential is this one? I wrote it carefully such that it's exactly the example we wrote there. You see that the example we wrote there has, if I did no mistake, yes, it has exactly the same dependence. Do you agree? The example we wrote there. So if I look here at this plane wave here, right? Indeed, this plane wave has e to the i p1 and 2 plus i p2 and 3 plus i p3 and 1 times these two S matrices. And therefore, because this must be true for any n1, n2, n3, equating these two exponentials, right, gives me that e to the i p3, let me write the 3 in a different color because soon I will generalize 3 to any number. e to the i p3 times l times s of P3, P1, S of P3, P2 equal to 1. In writing this, we used that S of PQ is 1 over S of QP. If you swap the momenta, you just uh, swap um, the S matrix. Okay? And as I said, let me write this 3 in orange. You see, I just connect, and I get similar equations for P2 and for P1. And what's the meaning of this equation? The meaning of this equation is very simple. I have my spin chain, and I have my three excitations. I have my excitation P1, 
my excitation P2, and I take P3 and carry it around the world. And as I carry it around, the total phase must come back to itself. And what's the total phase acquired by P3? There is a free propagation part, which is this exponential part here, the phase acquired by the particle as it goes around. But as it goes around, it, pa it passes by P1 and it scatters with it. And then it scatters by P2 and it scatters with it. And this total phase should be equal to 1. Okay? So this is the generalization of the usual equation that you are using if you have just a free particle on a circle where you write that e to the i p l equal to 1. Just the periodicity condition of the momenta when you have periodic boundary conditions. And here we see that this is, as I said, the next to simple case after a free theory where it is not just e to the i p l equal to 1, but it's e to the i p l plus the phase acquired when it goes through the other particles is equal to 1. Okay? <coughs> So more generally, we would write that e to the i pk times l times the product of j not equal to k of s of pk pj equal to 1, which means that if I have a general system of many particles, take one particle and take it around the world, it scatters with the other particles, and the total phase must be 1. And this equation, I should satisfy it for k equal 1 up to n. And these equations that quantize the momenta are called beta equations. Okay? So the claim is then very simple. If you want the spectrum of the Heisenberg spin chain, you don't need to put a 2 to the L by 2 to the L matrix on a computer, which is hopeless. All you have to do is find all solutions to this equation. Once you find a solution, the energy, so let's write both here together to summarize, the energy is sum of 4 lambda sine square of pj over 2. So, this is the full solution to the spectrum of the Heisenberg spin chain. Okay? You tell me how many, how many magnets you want, you put 10 magnets, you find all solutions to this equation, this gives you all energy state with 10 spin flips, and this is the energy of the corresponding state. Okay? Now, this looks a little bit complicated to solve because, uh, because you see that this S matrix is a little bit complicated and, uh, and these equations look uh, slightly messy. However, if, uh, can I continue writing here? Is it okay if I write here? In terms of u, if we use these nice variables u, these equations become quite nice, and the same box becomes the following. The energy, as we said, becomes just the sum of lambda over u squared plus one quarter. So no more trigonometric functions, just rational functions. It's nicer. But so is the S matrix and the bit equations. And the bit equations become just uj plus i over 2 over uj minus i over 2 to the l times product over k not equal to j uj minus uk minus i uj minus uk plus i equal to 1. Okay, you see there's no trigonometric, nothing trigonometric, it's just a bunch of polynomial equations. I say polynomial because you can put everything, you can multiply the denominator to the other side. So you just have a bunch of polynomial equations, or rational equations if you want, you solve them, and then the energy is just given by the energy of each of the excitations. Okay? So the S matrix becomes very simple, the momentum becomes very simple, that's why this variable u, which is called the beta rapidity, is such a useful thing to, to have.
Okay. So let me uh, let's summarize a little bit. Today I did much less than I wanted to do. It's a pity, but okay. Um, um, so let's summarize a little bit. So we are saying the following. We are saying that there are some systems for which there exists some kind of hidden symmetry, some hidden charges, and these hidden charges guarantee that when I scatter particles, excitations in these systems, the scattering of this excitation factorizes and decomposes into a sequence of two-body scattering events. Now, if you know that this is true, you can jump everything we did. You can say, well, but then I can write the spectrum of these theories right away. I just say the spectrum of these theories, if you tell me that this is true, I'll just write down bit equations right away. I don't need to go through all this derivation because the physics is clear. If there is another system with another S matrix, you just go and write down exactly the same equations. You just replace here the S matrix by the S matrix of your theory. Because the picture will always be the same. You will have a particle, and as it goes around the world, it scatters with the other particles. That's always true. And if the scattering is integrable, this scattering can be decomposed into a product of two body scattering events. And therefore, this formula will hold. So if I tell you I have a theory which has some excitations and they are integrable, all you ask me is, please give me the dispersion relation and the S matrix. And then you write down these equations right away. You don't care about the wave function, the cat, the bra, the Hamiltonian, nothing. The physics of the model, of an integrable model, the real physical meaning, the physical data, is not the Hamiltonian, the wave function, none of that. The physical data of the Hamiltonian is, what is the S matrix? What's the dispersion relation? So if you tell, I have a model which has relativistic dispersion relation. So epsilon of p is not this, but it's square root of m squared plus p squared. And then I tell you, and the S matrix between two excitations is a bunch of gamma functions, whatever, something. I say, okay, that's all I need to know. Then I plug here the S matrix, I plug here the dispersion, I resolve the equations, and I get the spectrum of my integrable model. Okay? So integrable models are models for which the data is much simpler to get, and it's based on the two-body S matrix, and, um, and the dispersion relation. Now, why is the model integrable? We understood this is related to the existence of higher charges, because existence of higher charges implies that wave packets can be moved by amounts that are p-dependent, and therefore, a process, even if it's prepared to scatter at a given position in space-time, we know should give the same amplitude as one where the processes took place in a very separated chronological order, and therefore, we get this factorization. Then, of course, the reason is, how do we know a priori, if you give me some theory, whether we are lucky or not to have integrability? And here there are two things we can do. One thing is do an experiment. What do I mean by do an experiment? Write a three-body S matrix. It's with a three-particle uh, three particle wave function that you will learn. Because if you do one particle, all one particles are the same. It is just plane wave by translation invariance. All two particles are the same. It is just incoming and outgoing by conservation of energy and momentum. It's with three that you have the real test. With three particles, things could start failing. So that's one thing. I can put three particles and see. Can I find, can I solve the three particle wave function with a simple ansatz like that? If it works, very likely the theory is integrable and then for n particles it should work because it's really the crucial test. The other way that we will see tomorrow is to follow a more constructive route, is to try to find out how can we construct Hamiltonians in a way that we are guaranteed that these charges Qn are there from the beginning. So then we have to understand where are these charges and how do we understand that this Hamiltonian has these extra hidden local charges. And if we understand it in this case, then we can start trying to make a catalog of all possible spin chains which have these hidden charges. Then we don't even need to check. Then we know it must work because we know that we are constructing Hamiltonians that have these extra charges there from the get-go. Right? Uh, <clears throat> so in the exercise, you are asked to do three things. Uh, one thing is to look at a problem similar to the one we saw yesterday of some electrostatic equilibrium position and see where the zeros of these electrostatic equilibrium positions are. This problem looks a bit ad hoc. Why am I proposing it at all? There are two reasons. One is because it obliges you to go and revise what we did yesterday. But it will be directly related to a particular semi-classical limit of these equations. 
Because these equations, even though they might look very different from the ones they saw yesterday, we will see that actually to think about them, this electrostatic picture will also be very important, and it is not very surprising that we will again start thinking about how do we understand these properties of these magnetic materials by thinking in terms of some auxiliary electrostatic equilibrium position. So that problem will also be relevant for the study of spin chains. And then you are asked to take the two-body S matrix and check that it goes through the Hamiltonian. This will allow you to see that indeed it works because of the precise relative coefficient between the two terms being given by the S matrix, otherwise it would fail, which is exactly what we expect. And as a third exercise, for you to start becoming a bit familiar with these bit equations, I ask you to just consider the simplest possible solu non-trivial solution where you take two particles with momenta P1 and P2. Let P2 be minus P1, so you just scatter them head on. And you try to plug in these equations P1 equal minus P2 and find what, is the, what are the solutions to this bit equation. Let's give you what are all states that contain two excitations with opposite momenta. Okay? So any question about the lectures or about what is proposed? So if not, tomorrow we will start by unveiling why do we have such miracle and why were we able to solve this a priori exponentially complex problem. <laughs>